So once we've collected our data, one of the first things we want to do is go ahead and explore the data to look at the descriptives, look at um, the responses themselves, and see what's going on with it, even before we begin our analysis. This is a chance to do a little bit of data screening up front uh, to make sure that we have good data, make sure we understand our data, so we can make the best choices regarding the analysis of that data as we go forward. So one of the first things that, things that we will want to do is look at the responses themselves. Each of our variables has a certain number of levels, right? So we typically have, uh, so for a Likert type, it's one, two, three, four, five. Uh, it might be, you know, low, medium, high. Uh, certain levels that we have uh, across those variables. It's pretty rare that we look at a, a truly continuous variable, right? And going out to third, fourth, fifth, sixth decimal place, even if we were looking at weight, um, we would typically use whole numbers uh, when we do that. When we do age, we typically just look at whole numbers of age. So in IO psychology, we typically use um, whole numbers and what are essentially discrete variables, as I've talked about them before, though we treat them as continuous variables because for our purposes, they essentially are continuous. Um, there are statistical reasons not to do that, but that's typically what we do. So the first thing that we want to look at for any particular variable is the responses themselves on that variable. How much do we get of each level? And the way we um, often do that is we look at a frequency distribution of the responses. So let me show you what that looks like. So let's say um, that I had this Likert scale and it was one, strongly disagree, two, disagree, three was neutral, four was agree, and five was strongly agree. Uh, and then uh, I sent out my survey and I got my responses uh, to this, just this one question, this one item. Uh, and so this is my item number. Can't read that, it says item number. There's no reason you should be able to read that. Uh, and then number of responses. So if I look at my data set and my sample, uh, how many of each possible answer did I receive? So in this case, let's say that I received that five people marked one, 10 people marked two, 20 people marked three, 10 people marked four, and five people marked five. So this is our frequency distribution of responses. It's about one variable, uh, and it's about how many people or how many instances we received of each level of that variable. That is what a frequency distribution is all about. Five people said one, 10 people said two, 20 people said three, 10 people said four, and five people said five. A little bit of information we get from this, and one of the first things that I wanna talk about is the idea of the mode. So the mode we'll talk about uh, later on is a measure of central tendency, but what's important here is the idea that the mode is the most frequent response. Most frequent response. So in this data set, if we look at the responses being one, two, three, four, or five, we saw the number three come up as a response more often than any other response. So in this case, the mode is equal to three because we had 20 responses for three and that's more than we got. We got 10 for two and 10 for four. We got five for one and five for five. So 20 for three makes three the mode. Uh, and, and that's all the mode is, right? It, it, it's, it's a little bit scary. You may remember it from undergraduate statistics or something like that, but, but ultimately it's just the most frequent response of all of the response options. In this case, the mode is three. Now, if we were gonna take this frequency distribution, right? Again, it's just this, it's just a table, right? Nothing to be scared of here. It's just a table with all possible responses and how many people responded to that. We might take a look at um, maybe a bar graph of those responses and see what it looks like. So uh, if we plotted a bar graph here in which we had the responses on the x-axis, right? And so we have these level, different levels. And there's one, two, three, four, and five. And then up here we had the frequency. Right, so that, that says frequency. Again, you probably can't read my handwriting and I can't spell anyway, but that says frequency. So we would plot the, the possible responses and the frequency for each one, and basically we just create a bar chart uh, for this, right? So 
uh, let's say this is 5, 10, 15, 20. The way this would look is, okay, so for answer one, for the, for the level one of the variable, uh, five people gave me that, right? And so there's a nice bar for five. Uh, for level two, a response of two, 10 people, right? Okay. For response three, that was 20 people. For response four, that was 10 people. For response five, that was five people again. So all this is, is a bar graph um, that indicates uh, each of the possible responses, one through five, and the number of people who responded with each of those, right? The frequency uh, of those responses. When we graph it in this way, this is what we call a histogram. And a histogram is just a graph, a bar graph of the frequency distribution uh, of one variable. So that's an important point is that a histogram is only ever one variable and it's the frequency of each of the re of responses for each possible level of that variable. It's just a graphical representation of the frequency distribution. Now what's neat about this is we can tell some stuff by looking at it graphically, we can tell some stuff right away. Um, for instance, we can immediately see that the mode here, right? The, this peak represents the mode. Uh, we see that we have at 20, we have a mode of three, right? Same answer we got before, but now it's not that hard when we look at this graph, but if we're looking at lots and lots of numbers, if we plot it in this way, uh, it becomes immediately obvious what the mode is. Uh, a couple other things that are interesting about this particular frequency distribution, if we look at it, the shape of it really matters. And, we, and we'll talk about why this shape matters later, but what we, some things that we want to note about this, uh, this particular shape. For one, it is symmetric. So if we were to fold this frequency distribution, this histogram in on itself, it would be the same on either side. It is symmetric. When we talk about the symmetry of the frequency distribution, as shown in the histogram, we are talking about skew. Skew is the word we have that just refers to the symmetry of that distribution. This has, uh, essentially, it is not skewed, right? Because it is symmetrical on either side. Now, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes we might get something that looks like this or sometimes we might get something that looks like this, right? And if we see, if you go from the mode down, it, you can't fold that over on itself and call it symmetrical. It's not symmetrical. These are skewed frequency distributions. Now, with the, when we refer to skew, we often use the words positive or negative skew. And what that means is where is the tail? Where is the longer tail? So in this case, this is a negatively skewed frequency distribution because that that longer tail kind of points in a negative direction. It's off to the left. On the other hand, the tail over here, which means that there are more extreme values off in the positive direction, this is called a positive skew. So again, remember, think about what this represents. This represents, okay, some people answered this, some people answered this, some people, not that many, right? Most people answered here. Some less, some less, right? Some less, some less, not too many. But then there's like these little outliers out here. That's what skew is all about, is having these outliers off in the negative direction or these outliers off in the positive direction. So this is positive skew, this is negative skew. Skew is about the symmetry. Uh, now we can also, if we're going to describe this, we can talk about the modality. And modality just refers to um, how many modes we have. Right? So in this case, this distribution that I showed you here is what we call unimodal. Which one, uni, meaning one, unimodal, has one mode, right, right here at, at three. Um, right, I can draw that a little better, that's three. Right? That's not the only option. We can have uh, bimodal distributions, right, where we have two peaks. This usually represents maybe we have two populations mixed into, the, uh, into our sample. Uh, and so we have two modes for some reason, right? This would be bimodal. You can have trimodal, I guess you can have quadrimodal, right? Just depending on how many modes you have. You can also have essentially no mode. This is called the uniform distribution. If we have the same number of responses on each, um, we just call it the, we don't call it non-modal, we call it the uniform distribution. 
But the modality of this is another thing that we get that describes the shape of that frequency distribution. How many modes does it have? Uh, does it have one? How many peaks, right? That, that peak gives us an idea of, of what, what the mode is and how many modes there are. There doesn't have to be one, uh, right? And in, in some cases, this may even be like just like a little bit lower. And so we would say, well, this is the mode, but this is still kind of a bimodal distribution because it has those two peaks. The other thing we look at is what we call, well, kind of what I call peakedness. Oops, that's falling apart, right? And so the idea of peakedness is how much of a peak is there? This, so look, if we look at this frequency distribution, right, there's no like 15, right? It just goes from 10 to 20. So there's actually a fair amount of peak in this particular distribution. Right? So we have really kind of three types of peaks that we talk about. There's the very, very peaked, right? There's essentially no peak, right? That unimodal, or excuse me, the, um, the uniform distribution would be no peak at all. And then we have kind of our, our average peak. So a very high peak is called, um, well, first of all, I should back up and say, when we talk about the peak in this, we are talking about kurtosis. Uh, when we're talking about a very high peak, we say it is leptokurtic, right? Fancy word. You'll probably never see it except for in a stats class, but that's the word, leptokurtic. Uh, on the other, sand, other hand, when it's very flat, as the uniform distribution is, this is what's known as platykurtic. P-L-A-T-Y-Q-R-K-U-R-T-I-C. So platykurtic. Uh, very flat. Again, a, a word that you'll never see except in a stats class. And then when it's just nicely in between, this is called mesokurtic, right? And so this is kind of just like a nice, nice average uh, peak, uh, as it were. So these are the ways that we can describe the shape of the frequency distribution in our histogram. Uh, we refer to the number of modes, uh, the modality of it, right? Is it unimodal? Is it multimodal? Uh, we can talk about the kurtosis, which is how peaked it is. And we can talk about the skew, which is about how symmetric it is. Um, we can also get, so part of this we get from just looking at the histogram, looking at the frequency distribution, which we can get out of SPSS or R or any other statistical program. Um, the other thing is oftentimes we can actually get the uh, particular numbers that describe the skew or the kurtosis. Now there's, um, and so that'll give us some idea as well. Um, there's no real statistical tense, test about when is it mesocurtic, when is it platycurtic um, that we really care about. Uh, but there are numbers available to us that we can look at when we talk about the normal distribution. We'll talk about what we're looking for there. Um, but what I just want you to get out of this particular video is the idea that we have a frequency distribution, which is just a listing of all possible levels of a variable and how many responses we got for each level of that variable. The histogram is a graph. It's a type of bar graph. Not all bar graphs are histograms. Um, but it is a type of bar graph in which we have the levels of the responses on the x-axis and the frequency of each of those levels on the y-axis. Uh, and then for each of those bins, each of those possible answers, we just plot the frequency with a bar graph. Then we look at the shape of that histogram to give us an idea uh, and some information about the shape of our frequency distribution. We can talk about the skewness, which is the symmetry. We can talk about the kurtosis, which is the peakedness. Uh, we can talk about the modality, which is how many humps that it has uh, in order to describe that shape. And then finally, again, the mode is the most frequent response. So in this case, number three was the mode uh, because we got more responses for three than we did for any of the others.